So let's look at how well the enforcement of Hamilton's plan worked. The whiskey tax was collected across the nation, but in one region in Western Pennsylvania, the economics of whiskey are peculiar. This is a part of the country where subsistence farming is predominant. In other words, people use the produce on their farm either to feed themselves or to trade with their neighbors. The reason they do that is because this is an area located beyond the Appalachians, meaning that what you can farm well in that part of the country, which is mostly grain and corn, you can really transport to market because the transportation costs are prohibitive. You can't, you have no roads across these mountains, you can barely get across them on a good horse. So um, if you do want to farm a cash crop, the best bet is to distill your grain into whiskey. By doing that, you decrease the bulk and you increase the value. At that point, it, make, it might make sense for somebody to strap a couple of gallons of whiskey to their horse and take them to market on the eastern end of the Appalachians and still make some money. Most of the people who make whiskey in that part of the country do that in small stills on farms. And because if you need cash, you always know that you could make your whiskey into cash, uh, people start using the whiskey as cash. Because everyone knows that if you really need it to cash in, if you really need coin, you can take your whiskey to a wholesaler in Pittsburgh who will give you actual money for it. So since the whiskey is as good as money, you might as well settle your accounts in it. And a couple of things that whiskey shares, a couple of uh, features or characteristics it shares with gold and silver. It doesn't spoil. If you keep it properly stored, it will not change its quality and consistency. You can subdivide it into as many units as you want. You can buy a horse for a gallon or you can make a thimble full to pay your grocery bill. So in many ways, it's a good money commodity. Uh, as long as you don't drink it, obviously. Now, here is a map of the state of Pennsylvania. What you see here is that this is the state, you know, the black outline here. Philadelphia is located over here. The region where the Whiskey Rebellion takes place on this confluence of these two rivers here is where Pittsburgh is. Um, and there's mountains in between, not as high as the Sierra Nevada, but many more of them and kind of really awkward to get over because there are these folds. Um, and once you're over one mountain ridge, then there is another, and that goes on and on. So the population centers and commercial centers on the eastern shore uh, of the country, Baltimore, Philadelphia, and New York, are far. And the density of population indicated here by the red dots is much, much lower in this part of the country. So it's almost like it's a totally separate country. You can get there from here. Um, now the problem is, however, that this region is treated by the same standards as everybody else, where whiskey is in fact just a luxury and it is often produced not by people on their farms on a small scale, but rather in large stills in the cities. And since the whiskey tax is applied as a lump sum per still, once you reach a certain economy of scale, you can just pay off the tax in a flat fee. Um, this is heavily skewed against the small producers. Now the Western Pennsylvania farmers who, are um, who must pay their whiskey tax in cash, as you recall, have just one way of raising cash and that is to make and sell whiskey. So their means of paying the tax is what is being taxed to begin with. The farmers therefore protest and they try to explain their situation, but they're told that they have to pay. What they do in response is what they did in the revolution and in the protest movement leading up to the revolution. They tar and feather a tax collector, they burn down his house, they send a petition, in other words, exactly the same kind of stuff, and in fact, against the same kind of revenue measures um, that they dealt with with the British. 
Now, Hamilton and Washington, who are in fact located in Philadelphia, the city of Philadelphia at this time is the capital of the United States, Washington DC does not yet exist. It is only starting to be built. Washington and Hamilton don't look at this as a local economic issue. They look at it as a broader geopolitical issue. So their view encompasses the entire eastern part of what now is the United States. From their perspective, the area highlighted here where the Whiskey Rebellion takes place is a part of the country that is not, where they have not asserted their control and therefore not their sovereignty sufficiently. And the rebellion gives them an occasion to do that in a forceful way. So if you look at the bigger picture, the closest by city to this region is in fact Toronto. Um, if you want to get from here, from Western Pennsylvania to the Eastern seaboard of the United States, because of the transportation issues getting across the mountains, the fastest way is in fact down the Ohio River, down the Mississippi River, through the port of New Orleans, which at this point belongs to Spain, around Florida, up the coast, and you'll make it there faster than if you try to go across the mountains, especially if you're hauling anything that's bulky. So for Washington and Hamilton to tie this part of the country closer to the east um, is a challenge. If you look at the political situation, to get from Western Pennsylvania to the east of the country, you need to go through Spain. Spanish America is all the way along the Mississippi River. And the British recently fought against in a war, control not just Lake Erie, but in fact, although the south shore of Lake Erie is technically United States territory, they maintain forts there, as well as a navy on this lake. While there are, outlined here in red, borders between the United States and the European colonial powers next door, these borders run through the middle of nowhere. There are no guard posts, there are no markers. So in fact, out west, the border isn't even very clearly defined because in many places, these are regions where Europeans have never set foot and where they don't go on a regular basis. So you have French and Spanish and um, US fur traders and trappers mixing with the predominantly Native American population in the valley of the Mississippi and of the Ohio. So this culture this, in this region here is a whole lot different from what you have in the Eastern United States. The Iroquois Confederacy, which claims this, used to claim this part of the continent as their homeland, has only recently been uh, defeated after the revolution. This is now the new Northwest of the country that Jefferson and others want to divide and give away to white settlers from the East. So in order for that to work, you really need to have loyalty, peace and quiet in that part of the country. So from that perspective, Hamilton and Washington are afraid of separatism. The conservative, the Federalist press in Philadelphia starts to distribute um, fake news stories that Spanish agents had shown up in Pittsburgh and had promised the local population exemption from any and all taxes, as well as the right to keep their Protestant religion if they joined the Spanish Empire and abandoned the United States. That is really all that Hamilton and Washington needed to go to town on these whiskey rebels. For the whiskey rebels, this was about their livelihood. Um, it was about the fact that they can't conceivably pay that tax because the one thing that they make that they can cash in on is the thing that is being taxed. For Washington and for Hamilton, this is about a principle. Um, they want to ascertain their territorial claim the sovereignty, as you recall, the idea that you have the right to govern the people in the territory that you claim. But in order to be considered sovereign, you actually have to be able to 
to show to the world and to your local population that you are in charge. So this gives Washington and Hamilton that opportunity. Washington is not taking a charitable view of the rebels. He describes the local population as basically um, subhuman. One quote of his says, the people there live little better than cats and dogs. So when he um, takes the extraordinary step, not done since then, of marching the army in person, along with his secretary of the treasury, who revives his wartime role as his aide de camp into the field within the, your own country. Um, Washington is determined to make an example out of these peasants. So um, once again, this is the first and only time that the commander in chief actually goes and leads an army in person. Uh, and he does that in order to fight against his own people. Washington is not disinterested in Western Pennsylvania. He knows the region well, because in the Seven Years' War, or French and Indian War, Pittsburgh is the exact place where he gained his first experience with military command. When the British general in charge of their small troop that was sent to take out a French fortification in the place where now Pittsburgh is located, uh, when, when Washington's general, General Braddock, was killed, Washington was left in charge as a young colonel, and so this is how he, he gained his first experience as a military leader. Um, his big accomplishment was to get the surviving men, after a major defeat, out of there again alive. But he kept notes on the region, and once the revolution was done and the War of Independence was over, this was now land belonging to the United States, and he bought a lot of that up. So Washington was one of the largest landowners in Western Pennsylvania, and many of the people who were farmers there had simply taken up residence on land, the ownership of which they really didn't care about. In other words, they were squatters. And in many cases, George Washington was the landlord, except they didn't care. So um, all of that gives Washington a stake in this. The way that the army proceeds, they make an example of the farmers. Um, the locals are horrified that they herd together people with very little consideration for actually figuring out whether or not they took part in a rebellion in the open, uh, in, in bad weather, in cold, rainy conditions, then decide that a couple of people who are ringleaders, about a dozen people, needed to be executed um, but they want to do that in Philadelphia to really make the show of it, and they take them back east with themselves. Um, the farmers' movement collapses after this massive show of force. However, the people who were slated for execution are eventually released after a, a round of, of protests by the Democratic Republican press and the objections of Thomas Jefferson once they get back to Philadelphia, um, it, it's not politically feasible to actually kill these people on a very thin basis of evidence. So what happened here? Uh, what you see is a counter-revolution that was carried through. The Declaration of Independence had been all about equality and rights, individual rights. That's the first principles stated in the Declaration of Independence are truly revolutionary at the time. In the British system, it was all about inequality and nobody had rights except by virtue of being subjects of the king. The Declaration of Independence says you have rights because you're a human in a state of nature and then you make yourself a government to make sure you keep those rights and you all have equal rights to that government. The Constitution backtracks from that and gives a blueprint for applying and wielding power. And the guiding principle behind that is you want to make the United States into a sovereign nation. And once again, sovereignty means that you are in control of a territory and that you have a right to assert that control against challenges from below, like the uprising by farmers, and abroad, like claims by foreign powers, as in this case, Spain, to taking away parts of your territory. So for Washington and Hamilton, that had now been accomplished, and not until the Civil War 
did another part of the country attempt to secede, um, and they didn't get away with it either. So the sovereignty of the United States was well established, for better or worse, because many people in the initial revolution didn't think that sovereignty was such a great thing in the first place. It was something that you had, that had come into being with kings, and if you got rid of kings, and the king, of course, is often called the sovereign, um, why do you need to keep that? 